You're welcome to the Economy and Politics Show. I am Otto Abasi Abasekom. This edition will discuss rising inflation in Nigeria and implications for households and businesses. Joining me virtually for this conversation is Dr. Muda Yusuf, the Chief Executive Officer of the Center for the Promotion of Private Enterprise. It's nice to have you on the program, Dr. Muda, once again. Thank you. Thank you very much. My pleasure, Otto. Thank you. Let's begin with rising inflation. Of course, uh, last week we saw headline inflation peak to 29.9%, almost 30%, and food inflation surged to 35%. What are the implications for households? Because we've seen videos of complaints of the price of commodities and various other services. People are really, really going through challenging times. But from your perspective as an economist and a stakeholder in the private sector, what are the implications for households? Well, uh, actually, you don't need to be an economist uh, to know the implications. <laughs> yes. Even from your question, uh, you, you already even provided some of the answers. Mm. Uh, the implications are very, very profound uh, in a negative sense uh, because of the impact of inflation, particularly galloping inflation, uh, on the purchasing power of the citizens. Because you can only consume or buy what you have the ability to buy. And because the ability to buy, which is the purchasing power, is being eroded massively because of inflation, uh, a lot of citizens are getting deeper into poverty. Uh, the welfare situation is getting to a very worrisome level. Uh, and even for those uh, people who are struggling to do some small businesses here and there, the, the businesses, many of the businesses are grinding to a halt. Mm. Because, I mean, if you are running a business and nobody is buying, then what is the essence of the business? Yeah. Then the level of volatility is so is so profound that even those who are in business are struggling to, 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 to struggling for survival because almost on weekly or even daily basis in some, sometimes, prices are changing because of the volatility in the environment. So seriously, there, there is a very serious issue with poverty. And these things have a way of degenerating into some kind of social tension, which all of us can see and perceive. And of course, we're also seeing elements of protests here and there. And these protests are real. These are reflections of the pains that the citizens are going through. So when you have a situation where access to basic needs of life. I'm talking of food, transportation, uh, pharmaceutical products, basic things is being threatened. Then you have a, a very, a very serious uh, issue on our hands from a social perspective. So it's, yeah. it's a very serious situation as far as the households are concerned. Yes, and every, every country wants to avoid issues of social crisis. But let's look at yeah. the from the CPPE standpoint, what are the implications? You just tried to dive into it, but broadening it, what are the implications of this rising inflation tide on the business environment and their sustainability? Because it's very important. Like you rightly said, businesses are reeling through this. They have to sustain, to create jobs, to continue to support economic activities and create wealth. Well, uh, for businesses, it's extremely very difficult because many businesses cannot transfer the additional cost because this inflationary situation is impacting on the cost of operations and the cost of production. As a business person, typically, and that is supposed to be the normal thing, whatever your cost is, you pass it on to your consumers or to your clients, and you add a margin on it so that you can sustain the business. But we find ourselves in a situation where for most businesses, this additional cost cannot be transferred to their consumers or to their clients because there is serious consumer resistance. Therefore, it is the businesses that are absorbing most of this cost. And what that means is that it's eroding profit margins, in some instances, it's even eating into the capital, the working capital of these businesses. 
That is how bad the situation is. Hmm. Many of these businesses are just there, not because they are making any profits, but just to keep the business going and to generate some liquidity and some cash flow, just to keep the system running. Many of them are running at, at a loss, many of them. Because the replacement costs, in most cases, are extremely higher than even their selling prices, which is, which is, which is a very serious thing, you know? So uh, sustainability is threatened for many businesses. And because of what is happening with the exchange rates, many businesses, particularly those who have uh, this foreign exchange exposure, are having even more difficult challenges. That's why many of them are declaring losses, including even the, the very big firms. Mm. You know, because the, the exchange rate depreciation has aggravated their costs. Mm. It has aggravated their exposure in terms of having to pay for offshore obligations, and also in terms of having to make returns to their shareholders abroad. So part of the most vulnerable segments of businesses that is affected by this are the, are the multinationals hmm. because of their high level of foreign, uh, foreign exchange exposure. Domestic firms, of course, are also struggling because costs are growing, purchasing power is weak, sales are down, profit margins are being eroded. So a lot of businesses are at risk as we speak. So it's, it's, it's an extremely difficult situation for businesses across all levels. Mm. And then I'm talking of micro enterprises, medium, large conglomerates, multinationals. It's a very, very difficult time for everybody. So the households face low purchasing power and poverty, rising poverty, which could dovetail into social crisis. Businesses are facing sustainability challenges, which are amount to risk. So, Let's look at fiscal policy, which is very critical to tackle this rising tide of inflation. Private sector players have been writing. I mean, um, just last week, the National Association of uh, Chamber of Commerce, Industry and Mines and Agriculture wrote to the finance minister. Uh, they've made 12 point demands. And, and there's a quote here. They said, the private sector requires a transparent and coherent financial strategy, not the current piecemeal and reactionary policy making. So, I mean, they've made some key, key demands. From your perspective, would you say there's a clear coherence in policy coordination? People are even worried, what's the current economic model of the, of the government? Or are they overwhelmed? Because we saw tendencies to more market-driven economic approach, but I see we're having a command and control economic structure. What, what, what do you see? And how can we really begin to address this uh, challenge of rising inflation, which is affecting household and businesses? Well, the starting point for me, I think, is not even so much. Well, to some extent, the issue of coherence and coordination between fiscal and monetary uh, is important. And I think that uh, there is a lot of efforts to make that happen. You know, because on the fiscal side, there is very serious commit commitment to the issue of fiscal consolidation, reducing deficits, growing revenue. And we are seeing some, some rather positive traction with that on, on that on, on, on that side. But with, with regard to the monetary uh, aspect of it, I think the key challenge again has to do with the management of the foreign exchange market. The model that is on the table now that is being adopted and being implemented is a purely market model. That is a market-driven model. And what we have seen is that we have seen uh, a complete flotation of the currency. Mm. That is why we are seeing the kind of volatility that we are seeing and the commitment of the central bank to ensure that we completely eliminate the premium between the parallel market and the official yeah. official window. Yeah. yeah. Well, in theory, I think that is the way to go. But the thing about policy and reform is that as we progress with the implementation, we should continually 
periodically assess the impact and assess the outcomes. From what I can see, I think there's a need to go back to the drawing board to re-examine this market principle as far as it affects the foreign exchange market. I'm not saying that we should go to the extreme of fixing the exchange rates, but what we were told initially was we are, we are going to adopt a managed float. Mm. But the kind of flotation we are seeing is not appearing as if it is managed at all. This looks like complete flotation of the currency. Mm. And I have my reservations as to whether this economy or this foreign exchange market is mature enough, whether it has the fundamentals to completely float the currency. Because we need to relate to the peculiarities of our economy. We need to relate to the quality of the market. We need to relate to the imperfections in the market to determine whether we can go to the extreme of completely floating the currency. And we also need to do proper sensitivity analysis, you know, with respect to the impact of this flotation on the larger economy. Because in economies, there is what we call a general equilibrium approach to economic mm -hmm. management. Mm -hmm. As we deploy policies, we should not just have a narrow view of its assessment of, of, of its outcomes. We should look at the wider implications for other sectors, critical sectors of the economy. We should look at the implications for development, for production, and above all, for the welfare of the people. Those, that, that kind of holistic approach, I think, is very necessary. I think we need to go back to the drawing board and revisit this pure market model. I think we need to manage the foreign exchange better. We need to make it a, to reduce the volatility in that market. And we should not unify at all costs. I'm talking of unification between the official and the pilot. It doesn't have to be at all costs. Mm. Because the cost, from what I'm saying, the cost is becoming unbearable. Mm. It's even better to live with a dual exchange rate system than to continue to go through this kind of shock. And this idea of leaving the market open for every product to come in for foreign exchange, we need to revisit it. Yes, many of us presided for the three items and all this approach, unorthodox approach by Mefili, but Perhaps we may have to look at uh, those approaches and see what we can we can we can take from it, so that we don't dismiss everything. We cannot have an economy where we have limited foreign exchange, and where people who are importing essential products that are critical to the lives of the people, that are critical to production, that are critical to the energy, the health of the people competing in the same foreign exchange market with people who are importing things that are not essential, mm. especially when we are faced with a major supply constraint. I don't think the market model can work in that kind of environment. I think we need to revisit a lot of things, you know, to, to review the model and see what works. Because from mm. what I can see, complete flotation of the currency doesn't seem to be working for us. Given our current situation, given our current uh, fundamentals, and uh, given the high level of imperfections that we are seeing in our foreign exchange market. I'm happy this is coming from you, Dr. Muda, as one of the private sector stakeholders, because you've been an advocate for a market uh, driven model for the foreign exchange uh, um, approach. And you saying that the managed float is, is something that can be explored it is, is quite. Uh, uh, instruction. Yes, I, I said that, but please don't get me wrong. I know when I was advocating for the when I was advocating for the market, <laughs> I did say that we should not go to the extreme of yes, the market. Yes, yes, yes we I should know. recognize the reality of what we call market failure market in failure. economics. No, we yes. should recognize the role of the state, especially mm -hmm. in a developing economy. Yeah, all of these things we have to reckon with. That no, has no, always no. been my position. No, definitely. And I was just coming to the point, like uh, last edition of this show, I had the president of the corporate treasurers in Nigeria, and he said they need a predictable 
they need a, a market that is predictable, like you've always said, transparent, where you know that if you can hedge in three to six months and you know that your business is not facing unnecessary risk. So I think we're coming to that consensus of the need for a very flexible, transparent, but efficient uh, FX management system. And that brings me to our first MPC meeting scheduled for next week. Uh, what are your expectations? I know inflation is rising. It's an almost 30% headline. Food inflation is 35%. Uh, and we know that there are other concerns, the foreign exchange market, the cash reserve ratio. What do you expect to see? Do you expect to see a dovish or hawkish approach from the MPC meeting? Uh, what, what are your expectations? First of all, I thought we were supposed to have new members of the Monetary Policy Committee. I haven't heard much about that. Uh, yeah, there have been some news of uh, the, the president sending names to the, the National Assembly. Uh, for no, that's, that's for the, the board, board members. That. Yes, board and the that's MPC. That's for the board members. Okay, some, I haven't yeah. heard much about the MPC membership. But we we'll monitor that. But whatever it is. is. Yes, yeah. Mm. Okay, but whatever it is, uh, what is likely to happen is that given the stance of the uh, central bank, particularly you know, uh, going by the pronouncements of the CBN government, we are likely to see uh, a further tightening of monetary policy because we have been told about the policy option of inflation target. Mm. And the CBN has said that its target for inflation, I think, is 21%. Yeah. Now we are we are 30%. Mm. You know, that's, that's a, a long way to go. <laughs> Yeah, so no given that that's that scenario, I, I expect that there will be uh, some tightening of monetary policy. But I expect them, I expect the CBN or the MPC to go beyond just tightening monetary policy by way of either increasing CRR or MPR. I think some steps have already been taken. Uh, Treasury bills have been increased. I think that will help to, to mop up some liquidity. Homo rates, I think, have also been reviewed. That also helped to mop up liquidity. But my view from a real sector point of view is that we need to be careful so that we also don't push the interest rate too high. Because the pressure on investors in the economy is big enough, is profound enough. I'm talking of pressure from the FX, Forex, Pressure from the energy cost, pressure from you know issues of logistics, mm. and on top of that, we are seeing pushback from consumers because purchasing power is declining. So it's not a good time to be pushing up interest rates, you know, uh, in in a very very profound way. We need to be extremely mm. careful, yeah. uh, so that we don't further hurt those who are entrepreneurs in the economy because they have enough troubles already. Yeah. So we should look at other creative ways, other ways of reducing or managing liquidity, rather than just pushing up uh, interest rate because of the implications for production, for industries, for productivity, and uh, and even for growth. You know, high interest rate invariably hurts, hurts growth because it hurts investment. So it's a very delicate balance and. Uh, the fiscal authorities also need to weigh in to see what we can do about this inflation. Because from what we are seeing, uh, there's a limited extent to which monetary policy can tame inflation. I mean, we have been tightening monetary policy for almost two years. Yeah. What have we got out of it, mm. you know, in terms of taming inflation? So the fiscal authorities need to weigh in by reducing import duty, especially. Yeah. You know, liberalizing trade to some extent in a way that it will not cost the manufacturer so that we can strengthen the supply side of the economy and through that can moderate inflation. Yeah, very, very clear. Fiscal policy has a key role to play uh, to support what monetary policy is doing so that we can really begin to tame inflation and reduce its impact on the households, businesses, and generally the economy. Thank you very much, Dr. Muda Yusuf, CEO of the Center for Promotion of Private Enterprise for this very illuminating conversation on rising inflation and implications on households and businesses. And uh, we hope that we'll see some positive uh, developments so that when we next we have this conversation, at least we'll be smiling more than the concerns that we have in the country. Thank you once again, Dr. Murayusuf.
Thank you, Otto. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. To our viewers, if you want to get further insights on this conversation, visit the ProShare website displayed on the screen and follow our social media platforms to engage further on this show. This is to inform our viewers that ProShare will host its 2024 Converge of Economists that will discuss policy crossroads, choice between strangulation and expansion. It points to be a very exciting uh, webinar which will discuss the key issues in our economy today. It is slated for Friday, February 23rd, 2023 by 10 a.m. Join our website to get further information on this very, very groundbreaking conversation. So you come your way again, enrich yourself with the knowledge of socioeconomic developments around you because it is a wise thing to do. I'm also about Sebastian Kong. Thank you for watching and bye for now.